Hello, welcome everybody who's watching either live or or in the future. Um, we'll wait a couple of seconds and see if there's uh, if there's a few stragglers uh, ready to join in because uh, I'm I have a I have a German background and I'm punctual, so we start right at three when we say we're going to. <laughs> So, uh, quick introduction. Uh, my name is Andrew Welker. I'm R&D manager and an Axiom design engineer, and I have with me Ian Cahoon, who is the uh, president and owner of Axiom Audio. Yeah, welcome, and uh, welcome everybody to our our little uh, our little chat. Uh, we're going to. Um, we're going to talk today about a subject that we call the family of amplitude response curves and um, really try and explain just a little bit about what it is and uh, why it's so important, which um, in, in speaker design, there's, a, there's, there's certainly a lot, of, uh, a, a lot that gets talked about, uh, a lot of detail that uh, is is gone over ad nauseum and and uh, in many cases is really more on the fringe than it is really the heart and soul of uh, speaker design. I think if we wanted to really knock off what the big things about speaker design are, there are certainly things like um, dynamics. Uh, when does the speaker reach compression? What happens when it reaches compression? Uh, these things are. Uh, critical if, if you want to be able to turn it up at all and um, the other big the other big area that relates to sound quality is this thing called the family of curves so uh, it's something I've been uh, researching for uh, for 40 years I was very fortunate to uh, run into Floyd tool when I um, when I first started axiom and uh, and be able to hang around while all that research went on at the National Research Council in Ottawa. Um, and that was, you know, um, I think that uh, Floyd began that research probably in the early 70s. So by the time I got there, it was, it was really far along and we've taken it a long way since then. So what is the family of curves? Well, um, First off, you, you have to have, in order to measure these things, you have to have something called an anechoic chamber. And what that allows you to do is measure the response from the loudspeaker without any interference of the room, since the chamber, the chamber kills all reflections. So uh, there's a picture of our chamber with the floor in, and it's... Um, it's uh, perfectly anechoic uh, down to about 80 hertz. And then uh, below 80 hertz, we actually have an outdoor tower, a 100-foot tower, where we can take the speaker and microphone up the tower, and then we have a little portable uh, measuring system on a trailer down below. And then we can take measurements down below 80 hertz. And then we can take those measurements for each model into the chamber and write a correction curve so that when we're actually designing a speaker, we're seeing the whole thing from perfectly anechoic from 20 hertz to 20K. And um, so that's, that's what's required to make the measurements that are the family of curves. And then inside the chamber, you need to have the speaker sitting on a rotating table and we can control the rotation of the table uh, from out in the lab. And that, um, and then we can measure the speaker all the way around at uh, various increments. 7.5 has become our increment that we use. And then uh, you do that sort of, you know, horizontally and, and vertically. So we, we can, we have a whole arrangement to lay the speaker down and take the measurement the other way. And then uh, you, you can feed all of those measurements into the, the computer and you run a little little algorithm on it and what you end up with is the family of curves and I think most people are familiar with the basic measurement that you see the basic spec for a speaker you know it'll be 50 to 50 Hertz to 20 kilohertz uh, plus or minus 3 DB there's a standard spec 
And uh, that would be the on-axis response that's uh, being referred to there. And But the on-axis response is only one of the curves. Uh, all of these curves actually matter, and they matter a lot. So if you... Uh, we have two main curves that we use, the, the listening window and the sound power. And the listening window is uh, something that looks very, very similar to the on axis, or at least it should. If it doesn't, you'd better fix that. But um, it's, it's a, it's a, in our case, we're using a window out to 45 degrees. There's some variation on that. but So different people might have a different, slightly different calculation of the listing window. But ours, we go out to 45 degrees. And that's the top curve in that diagram that Andrew had up there. Uh, the curve underneath in that diagram is the total radiated sound power. So that is all of the measurements all the way around the speaker, um, uh, you know, right to the, 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 the 180 degree measurement. And then all of that is averaged together. And this sound power curve is uh, incredibly important. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as the years went by, the more I've realized that this sound power curve is, is, uh, is absolutely critical. If it, if it doesn't, it has to follow your listening window and your on axis curve. So in a front firing speaker, it'll follow it, but it'll drop, you know, by, it'll be down about 9 dB at 10 K. And, um, if this, if the basic shape of that curve doesn't look like the listening window curve, you're, your speaker is not going to do well uh, in a listening test. And uh, it's probably good to inject right now as to what, what, how we do the listening test, because this is, this is also very important in speaker design in that you need, you need some uh, uh, unbiased, um, repeatable way to verify that these measurements are, it makes sense. So we have, we have a room uh, for our double blind list and testing and there's a, there's an acoustically transparent screen. So that's all you see at the front is, is the screen and a test number. And then um, you have a switcher. We, 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 in our case, we leave it all up to the listener. So the listener has no idea what's behind the screen. Uh, they totally control what, what uh, uh, music they want to play. We have preset the level in advance between A, B, and C to be uh, exactly the same. And, and uh, you, you rely pretty heavily on, on something called modified pink noise to set that up. And you can also check it with other things, and white noise and whatever. But it's very important that the... The, the products behind the screen are at the same level because if one is slightly louder, then the louder one wins. And um, if you have a particularly bad product back there, it, it will still lose, even though it might be a little bit louder. Um, but in general, what we're testing is we're testing things that are all very, very good. I mean, most of these double blind listen tests are between slight variations in these amplitude response curves. And um, the interesting thing about this is that it's, it's what we call the low Q um, variations in the amplitude response curve that are very audible. So a high Q variation is very visible. You'll look at the curve and see something sticking up or sticking down and it, 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 you'd look at that and go, oh my God, that, that's going to sound terrible. And, and, uh, but yet it will not be as noticeable as something over a very broad range that's only you know, one or two dB different, but it's over a very broad range. So most of the listening tests we're doing, we're down to very you know, small differentiations. And, and um, you know, Sometimes you have to balance a little bit between your your listening window and your sound power. So if you can't quite get exactly where you want, you're going to have to give one place one to the other. And, and this is the sort of testing that's normally getting done in the double blind 
listen test. Um, it's, uh, you know, once in a while, a lot of people will bring in uh, products from competitors, and it's always fun to do that sort of thing. But from a research point of view, we're really more interested in what, what curves win here, what curves can win a double blind listen test. So um, that's a quick explanation of the what what this whole family of curves means. And um, it's extremely important to sound quality. And the other thing that's great about it is it's extremely repeatable. It's um, results from blind listen tests are consistent. I mean, it's extremely consistent. In the 80, 90% range, you'll, you'll have agreement on on which product has uh, has won or lost, and it, it's incredible. Because I mean, people are doing this individually; they don't know what other people have scored or what they wrote in the comments, and it's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, you look at the comments, and some of them are almost word for word the same as to why they chose this over that. And then we can take those comments and those scores and and uh, continue continue to work on the measurements in the anechoic chamber. Um, so that's, uh, that's how that works. And I thought uh, maybe Andrew could talk a bit about, you know, all of these measurements are done in anechoic chambers and how that relates to the room. And we actually know quite a bit about that too. We, we sort of know what, how all these response curves, once you play the product back in a room, how that actually interacts and what it is you hear. Right. Uh, if I go back for a second to this uh, this photo of a speaker in our chamber, and you can see it's sitting on a platform. That platform is uh, connected to a computer-controlled turntable. And as Ian was saying, uh, we can very precisely measure the speaker at stepped increments of X number of degrees. It can be anywhere from half a degree steps. Sometimes 15 degrees is used. We use seven and a half degrees. Um, and all the measurements are made with the microphone at a measuring distance of two meters from the speaker. But that two meters is always electrically corrected to give us a sound pressure level at one meter. The reason one meter is used is that's always been a standard for defining the sensitivity or the efficiency of a loudspeaker. Why do we measure though at two meters? Well, if you measured a big floor standing speaker at one meter, you would never have separated drivers integrate together. So we tend to measure at what would be a more typical listening distance. And you know, two meters is more conventional than, than one meter, which we would consider you know, extreme near field listening. So, why the listening window and the sound power is, is a nice convenient measurement for distilling all of that information and those measurements all the way around the speaker. I'll bring this up again and show you. So we've got two nice curves that we've distilled down all that information, all of those individual measurements into those two curves. And why that's important is that I'm just going to bring up this is just the horizontal measurement. So this would be actually twice as many measurements if we included everything that went into the sound power. Now, if you look at that, you look at that and you say, that's a mess, I can't tell anything from it. And the reality is that it's, we have to look at the trend of all of those curves, but more importantly, when we do the mathematics and the averaging to get us the listening window and the sound power curves, now you can see that it's distilled that big chunk of all of that data and all those curves that looks like a bunch of gibberish, frankly, into two curves that we can actually, that we can actually use. Now, how this corresponds to what you're actually going to hear in the listening room is very, very interesting because when when people first started measuring the sound power of a loudspeaker or the power response as it's sometimes called, um, there was a lot of discussion and argument of, you know, where, you know, how we should weight things and, oh, we only have to 
front hemisphere because there's nothing coming out of the back of the conventional forward radiating speaker. And it was found though that when you when you take a loudspeaker and you actually put it in a room, that all of that energy and it even even behind the speaker there is there is signal. It's down in level, particularly at high frequencies, but you've got resonances from the cabinet, you've got contribution from the port, if it's a rear ported speaker, and you have diffraction. So the tweeter, even though it's sticking completely away from you know where the back of the speaker is, some of those high frequencies will diffract and wrap around from the front towards the back of the speaker. And that information will reflect off of the surface or the back wall of your room. So we have to take it into account. If I go back to a second to this listening window and sound power curve, the listening window is the flatter, we would call flatter one in blue at the top and the sound power is purple. Now, what's very interesting is that if I set a measurement microphone and a pair of speakers in a typical room and I, I move the microphone around and take measurements from a couple of spots so that I can average out the the low frequency room modes, you actually will get a curve of that loudspeaker in an actual room that looks very, very similar to this sound power curve that remember was taken in an anechoic chamber. And it's actually very amazing. I mean, it's amazing when you think about it because you've taken all of that information, all of the measurements all the way around the speaker horizontally and vertically in an environment that has no reflections. And then you put it in a room where you have all of these reflections from the different boundaries, the floor, ceiling, the walls, and all of the things that are in the room. And you end up with a sound power curve. It's almost like the in-room response curve. So one of the things that I hear sometimes on forums and news groups and people going on about, well, we don't have to measure in chambers because we don't listen in an anechoic chamber. Well, there's a direct correlation I can give you to a set of measurements we do in a chamber that correlates almost 100% with what you'll me measure in a typical room. And when I say typical, I just mean, you know, a typically sized room with typical home furnishings, not something where we've done a lot of acoustic treatment or things like that. So that's one of the amazing things that comes out of this, this sound power measurement is that it does judge and define what the room sound is going to be. And hence that's why, you know, the National Research Council study and, and coming up with, uh, you know, the research that showed that these off axis curves were as important as taking just an on axis measurement. At the end of the day, what, what was really happening was it was a way to give us a, an insight into how the speaker is going to measure and sound when put into a listening room. So that's, that's really why it's, uh, why it's very important. That's, um, I think maybe we'll take a second and just take a look at what happens when when you do an omnidirectional speaker, which adds another little twist to the whole thing because now now your uh, sound power curve has actual information coming out the rear. So um, we've been at this a long time. Um, Andrew's been at it for his entire life. Uh, I got into it about. Uh, 10 years ago when I met Andrew. But this this is uh, a measurement from our new LFR 1100 active system. And as you can see, the listening window and the sound power are now on top of each other. And the, the sort of regular 9 dB drop in the sound power curve uh, up through 10K uh, is now, it's, it's sort of around 5 dB. So, but the listening window is also tilted down. And uh, you have to do this. If you, if you, if you made that actually flat uh, in an omnidirectional speaker, then it would sound horribly harsh and bright. Uh, we tried it. 
an absolute absolute disaster in the listening test. I mean, you have to you, if you're going to make these two curves the same, then you've got to you've got to bring it down so that. Um, um, Anyway, in a blind listen test, this speaker does spectacularly well. And for anyone who actually owns a pair of these, I, I think you can attest to uh, you can attest to how incredibly realistic sounding they are uh, when when you have something that can radiate in all directions. And we've used a digital signal processor to uh, correct every single one of these curves uh, to. You know, basically that that curve is is plus or minus one dB right across the range, uh, and the listening window and the sound power are exact, so we're not making any compromises between either one. So that's that's sort of the uh, state of the art as to where we're at on the family of curves these days. I had a uh, I had a question from uh, Mojo on the Axiom Axiom forums about how we you, you mentioned that we uh, you know we try uh, we strive to make these these sound power and listening window curves flatter, but he wanted to know well how do you I mean how do you boost or cut an area how do you modify that curve what what do you actually do to to get there like. And I, that's actually a very, very good question because, okay, so you want to bump it there and you want to cut it there. What do you actually have to do to get that? Yeah, it is interesting because obviously um, you would think, well, if I need to modify something in the off axis, you know, how do I do that without uh, modifying the on axis at the same time? And um, this is done... Uh, whether it's analog or digital, it's it's done with uh, complex crossovers. So, you know, forget about um, 6 dB, fourth order, second order crossovers, all of this, this stuff. That's far too simplistic in order to be able to manipulate the on axis and off axis at the same time. Because what you have is you have driver sets, obviously in a simple two-way bookshelf you have two drivers to deal with in something a little bit more complex like that m5 we were looking at um we have three driver sets and of course you get into an omnidirectional we have five but so the 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 two drivers have different off-axis responses which we can combine together however we want to create uh an off-axis response at that particular point that and it can be done without affecting the on-axis response. It's it's a little it's it's definitely complicated when you're doing it because uh, it's it doesn't run in uh, <laughs> it's not uh, it's not exact. It's not like you can uh, adjust the off-axis only. If you adjust the, adjust the off-axis, you have to realize it will affect the on-axis. So there's a bit of a balance to get all that to work. Um, but that is essentially how it is done. So the, the, the crossover of the driver is not just like this and like this. It's, it's, a, it's a real blend in between so that we can manipulate the off-axis response without ruining the on-axis response. Um, that's probably as clear as mud, but anyway, that's how it's done. Great if you have a digital signal processor. <laughs> And, and and technically, the interesting thing about about the you know the our omnidirectional speakers, the the LFR series, is uh, because even if it's the non-active version, if it's a standard uh, passive version of one of the speakers, where we have a uh, you know a, a digital signal processor in the chain and a separate amplifier for the front and the rear section of the speaker, technically we can actually make we can actually make the sound power and listening window as far apart or on top of each other in either case, right? We actually can manipulate that because depending on how much energy and the frequency response of, of what's coming out of the back of the speaker and how it blends with the front, we have the ability to actually sum those curves or make them as far apart up to a normal forward radiator by turning the, the back of the speaker off. So. It's an interesting thing. It's not just, and I think it's important to understand, it's not just the fact that it's an omnidirectional radiator and it has 
you know, sound is radiated in, in all directions around the speaker. It's the way that we can control and blend what's going on with the front hemisphere with the rear hemisphere to get exactly what target curve that we want. And that's different than, you know, some of these omnidirectional speakers that you see where you have a, some sort of spherical drive unit or enclosure. There's no way to manipulate that. That is literally fully omnidirectional in that it will measure exactly the same anywhere in space 360 degrees around the speaker. A speaker can still be omnidirectional, but not uniform in the way that it radiates sound at any particular point. So I think that's a, you know, that's an important distinction on, you know, how we do omnidirectional versus some of the products of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a question we've got about, uh, Oh, here's a can of worms for you, Ian, about how important is the step response of a loudspeaker? <laughs> yeah, um, sure, you don't want to answer that. <laughs> well, I, can, I mean, I can, I, can, I can answer it if you want. And I mean, the, the, my, my, answer, my answer would be that uh, it, it is important uh, not to dwell on it, i.e., uh, what we just talked about in terms of the amplitude response in the family of curves, that has to be first and foremost. If you design a speaker just to have the perfect step response and either ignore the amplitude response or say, I don't care, I'll allow plus or minus six or eight dB variations in the sound power, nothing you do to make a perfect step response is gonna make that a good sounding loudspeaker. End of story, we can prove it, we can bring you up to Dwight, Ontario, Canada, and do a blind listening test for you. It's not going to sound better. However, the step response is important. If you're looking at a perfectly passive loudspeaker, so you know one amplifier with a passive components creating the filter and crossover network that divides uh, what the drive units reproduce, the step response is important if you want to look at how the addition is happening and that you're handing off to the drive units in time. And the thing that's interesting is that if you get a good sound power, you by definition will have a good step response, at least as far as showing the addition and integration of the different drive unit sections, because Again, one follows the other to a certain extent. So you need to, you need to be careful there. So, I mean, I, I look at the step response of our speakers, but you know, you look at it sort of as a double check to make sure something wonky is not going on in the, the crossover you've designed. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's really quite similar with things like the phase response. Um, uh, you know, you don't necessarily want a linear phase response. In fact, uh, you'd probably just end up uh, making a mess of the amplitude response trying to get there. It's, uh, but you know, you, you do you do need to look at these things and, and make sure that the it, it's it's doesn't have anything odd going on in it. Uh, impedance, same thing. I mean, you don't you don't want a linear impedance, though. You know, some people have gone after that. Um, it's uh but you know you have to look at it. it it tells you a lot about what's going on with your speaker and it, it has to it has to conform to certain principles you might say um but really it comes down what we hear is the amplitude response i guess is the best way to to put it and not just the on axis amplitude response but all of it so um that's it. So I got a question from Stephen. Uh, what made you want to make speakers in the first place, Ian? <laughs> it, it's look. It's one of those things that just sort of happened. I I, I actually got into it in high school, uh, simply because um, I needed to save some money and I wanted some speakers. Uh, so I built my own and and. Uh, you know, I went out and read what I could read about it, and learned how to how this all worked, and went to uh, went to Toronto and bought some parts, and 
my buddy down the road had a nice little workshop happening there. So built my cabinets and, uh, and then what happened inevitably is, uh, you know, other people started to want to buy these, uh, speakers. So this went on through high school and through university where, you know, you know, not it wasn't a lot of them, but you know, you'd a few pair here and there. And when I'd go home for holidays, I would build them. And this is how I got started. And then after, uh, university, I decided that I wanted to uh, start a business and it just seemed so somewhat logical to, I already sort of had a business. Um, so it seemed logical to continue with that. And, um, but really the, the real, the big thing that I was so fortunate to have happen to me was to, uh, uh, to go to the NRC when I first started and meet Floyd tool and see what they were doing up there. I mean, you know, what I realized instantly when I arrived is I knew nothing about loudspeakers. Um, yeah, I knew how to build a cabinet and I knew how to buy drivers and I knew what, you know, how to make uh, crossovers to whatever various, um, you know, whatever, whatever various slope I wanted to make them and all the basic stuff. I knew all that, but this was an incredible eye opener as to what was going on. And uh, back in those days, it was very much, uh, believed that um, people heard speakers the way they might say taste something and you know so it varied from one person to the next and you had speaker companies that catered to particular types of music you know this is a rock and roll speaker you know this is a jazz speaker and then you had different sounds a British sound and west coast sound and east coast sound and it was it wasn't until the work that uh, Floyd did that we realized that this is not how uh, audio works. It's people will hear the same way. And, and no matter what music you decide to pick in the listening test, you'd have two people that listen to very, very different stuff. And they're going to come to the same conclusion about which one of those products actually sounded more realistic. So um, it was a big, big change. And the whole idea of the double blind listen test, which um, you know, uh, had really no idea how important that was. Um, you cannot do sighted testing. Um, I can tell you that nobody can, I can't, it's, it's not a, it's not a problem in any way. It's just how we humans work. If we can, our brains are very complex. If we can see what it is we're listening to, I mean, you can see it in the results. Um, the, the more expensive one will win. Um, or if people don't know anything about brands or price or anything, usually the biggest one will win. It's absolutely impossible to do uh, cited tests and then somehow, you know, claim you've done anything scientific. It's just the reality of it. It has to be blind. The results are not consistent unless it is blind. And once it's blind, you you get consistent results. And uh, when you're done your design, you can put your product out there. And in general, people will really love it. So, um, so yeah, I was so, so fortunate to get involved in that and, and then really get into the science of sound. And, I mean, it was just, it was so exciting at the time. I mean, I, I was... Um, like I say, I mean, I, I went in there, I had, I, I knew nothing compared to, <laughs> so I learned a lot in the very few first uh, couple of years and the product quality went way, way up, um, uh, you know, following these principles and being able to do the work in the anechoic chamber at the NRC. I mean, you could, you could rent the whole facility. So we had access to the double blind listen room. We had access to the chamber, all the measurement equipment, all of this. Um, so that really, really created, uh, Axiom as a, as a brand that stood for performance. And, um, that's still to this day. I mean, really what we care about is performance. It's, it's just, it's, it's number one in everything we, we, we do. Um, so there, that's how I got into it. Great. I'm going to uh, I'm going to answer one more question before we uh, before we wrap it up. And uh, 
I'll just I'll just say before I answer it, if we didn't get to your uh, answering your question, or you know, you watch this uh, video again later, or you're you're watching it uh, on on the replay later on, and you go, "Geez, I've always wanted to know this," or a question, just leave it in the comments. We'll keep monitoring that in the future. Um, and uh, we can always do another one of these videos if there's other topics that you'd like us to cover. I mean, we're happy to do that. So the, the last question we'll take today is, uh, what's the difference between our four ohm speakers and is there a difference in the sound quality between them? Between our, our which? A four ohm, our four ohm and our eight ohm speakers. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Um... Well, the impedance doesn't really have any uh, particular effect on the the sound quality, or or let's you know, let's say as it relates to the family of curves. It's more that um, when you're looking at high-powered speakers and you want it to be able to play loud and clean, um, you, you you probably want to go with a four-ohm speaker. It, it'll just uh, it'll simply get you know, you've probably got a big amplifier with lots of current there, and and uh, it, it'll make better use of the amp power. Uh, you're probably into multiple drivers, so, you know, um, you don't have to, I mean, we could change it by winding uh, different impedance coils and things like that, but, so no, it's, it's dynamic related. Um, I, you know, uh, in, in smaller bookshelf speakers and even smaller tower speakers, whatever, you probably want to stay more to eight ohms simply because the receivers driving it may start to have trouble with something with lower impedance. But once you get up into a big system with a big amplifier, four ohms is four ohms is a happy number. <laughs> right. Yeah. The only thing I'll add to that is that, you know, we, um, as designers, I mean, it depends. You, you'll typically see four ohms in a speaker that has more more drive units in it, because as Ian said, now you're having if you've got a speaker like our M100 that has three woofers, those three woofers are all connected electrically in parallel. So it's nominally, I think, a nine ohm woofer or a 12 ohm woofer, which three of them in parallel then gives you four ohms. Whereas if you have a bookshelf speaker with a single woofer and a single tweeter, typically they tend to be nominally around eight ohms. And so you get a speaker that's eight ohms, but there is, uh, there, you know, impedance has nothing to do with the sound quality of the speaker at the end. I think that's an important thing. You know, uh, an eight ohm speaker is not going to be better or worse than a six ohm or a four ohm speaker. It's just the electrical characteristics of the components and the design that went into that, uh, speaker. Mm. So I, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you, Ian, for your time. And uh, thank you, everybody who's joined in with us and watched. And like I said, if you enjoyed this video and you'd like us to do it, you know, do another chat on a different topic, hit us up in the comment section. We'll have a look at it and we get, you know, different topics to cover. Uh, we're going to uh, be happy to do another live chat session. So thanks a lot, everyone. Stay safe out there, and we'll talk to you later. Thanks. It was great fun. <laughs>